fungi are something that has captivated me for as long as I can remember. So, since yesterday at the very least. And even if they are a little outside of my channel's typical oeuvre, so to speak, I feel that they nevertheless deserve some time in the spotlight. When I last uploaded a video about fungi, it flopped, and that's a rather generous description of its performance. So clearly YouTube's algorithm wasn't favouring these mycological marvels. But you guys voted for more fungi. I like fungi, and it's my channel, so the algorithm can suck my balls. With that extremely professional and family-friendly intro done, let's dive right into another showcase of fabulous fungi that most of my viewers will probably never watch. And there are precious few better places in which to behold the weirdness and wonder of the world of fungi than the rainforest. Here in southeast Queensland, lush subtropical rainforests blanket many of the valleys and mountain slopes around the region. And even under the heat of the midday sun as it blazes down from a cloudless sky, the realm beneath the canopy remains cool, dark, and moist. A world apart from the sunlit zone above, and an ideal place for fungi to flourish. Small in stature, but difficult to miss, is Cytotrama aspirata, a rather common sight in the rainforests of southeast Queensland, wherein it often emerges from the rotting logs and stumps upon which it feeds. The vibrant orange shooting bodies are adorned with small woolly tufts, though they may be lost as the mushroom ages. More remarkable in form, if a little subdued in colour, is this Ramaria species, easily recognisable on the basis of its incredible coralloid structure. Ramaria is quite a widespread genus, and there are a multitude of different species in Australia alone, and unfortunately I can't quite narrow this one down beyond the genus level. It takes a keen and practised eye to spot many fungi amidst the dense and dimly lit rainforest undergrowth, but there are some that are much more difficult to overlook, even for the most casual and inattentive of bushwalkers. With their impressive size and flamboyant appearance, the fruiting bodies of Cymatoderma elegans must surely be some of the most spectacular that this country has to offer and nor are they at all an infrequent sight in these Queensland rainforests. As is the case for all the fungi I've featured, these apparitions are merely emissaries from an unseen domain, visitors to the outside world that, in terms of function, could be loosely compared to the fruit of a plant, with the main body of the fungus comprising an extensive network of filaments coursing through the organic matter upon which they feed hidden from our sight until such a time arrives that they're ready to reproduce and send their spectacular fruiting bodies up into the open air to set seed, figuratively fungi use spores, not seeds, to the next generation. Many passively shed their spores, but some send off their progeny with a little bit of a push. Of the many fungi that make their appearance in the rainforests of southeast Queensland, one of my personal favourites keeps a somewhat low profile. It certainly takes a sharper set of eyes to spot than the ostentatious Cymatoderma. This is Geastrum triplex, one of a fascinating group of fungi called the Geastraceae, colloquially known as Earth Stars, a common name that is a direct translation of the scientific one. With a maximum diameter of around 10 centimetres, the fruiting bodies of Geastrum triplex are regarded as the largest of any Earth star, and as is typical for the group, they are not anchored to the substrate, instead sitting loosely atop it. They begin as nondescript, partially buried egg-like structures, within which the developing spores are encased by two layers, the exoperidium on the outside, and the endoperidium beneath it. As the Earth star matures, the exopridium splits into multiple rays, steadily opening like some crude imitation of a flower, and exposes the rounded endoperidium at the centre. At the apex of the endoperidium is a small opening called the ostiole, situated at the centre of a pointed cone-shaped peristome. 
When pressure is applied to the endoperidium, be it from a raindrop, a bit of debris, or in this case, myself, a cloud of spores is forcibly ejected through the ostiole to be carried far and wide by the air. Geastrum triplex is a widespread species, occurring on every continent except Antarctica. Here in Australia, it can be quite easily distinguished from any other Earth styles on the basis of both its size and the fact that, in mature specimens, the exoperidium often splits a second time to form a sort of collar surrounding the endoperidium. In comparison, these Geastrum saccatum, a smaller and much more common species, lack the distinctive collar of Geastrum triplex. But one need not traverse the pristine wilderness of the rainforest to stand a chance of seeing these natural curiosities. This large, albeit rather aged, specimen of Geastrum triplex was something I stumbled on at work in the midst of a well-developed suburb just a few minutes away from Brisbane City. Urban settings are, indeed, utterly awash with a kaleidoscopic assortment of remarkable fungi, and a significant downpour of rain is often all it takes to transform even the blandest of parks and gardens into a miniature wonderland. Woodchip mulch in particular is prime habitat for the many species of fungus that feed on decaying plant matter, including some of the most unique, recognisable, and utterly bizarre of them all and oftentimes you don't even have to see them to be acutely aware of their presence. One morning spent coaching cross-country at one of Brisbane's multitude of public parks transpired in much the same way as usual. As I ran, shouldering the dual task of maintaining my own breathing and running pace, while simultaneously yelling at lazy fuckers who walk the whole course, my nose picked up an all-too-familiar scent. A scent that, while far from pleasant, drew me back to the park after the session to investigate a little more closely. Lo and behold, the numerous mulch beds we had been running amongst were alive with some of the most alien-looking fungi one could ever hope to see. Stinkhorns. While appearances may differ, stinkhorns are in fact close relatives of Earth stars, and, like them, their fruiting bodies begin as inconspicuous egg-like objects that scarcely rise clear of the substrate. The egg, in its turn, will eventually rupture, releasing from its gelatinous shackles a paradoxical manifestation of repulsiveness and intricate beauty, seamlessly intertwined in one otherworldly entity. Strange as they may seem, even by the standards of fungi, the fruiting bodies of stinkhorn still serve the same function as those that we would deem more typical in terms of appearance. That of course being, facilitating the dispersal of the fungus's spores. But unlike many fungi, when it comes to sending forth a new generation, stinkhorns are not beholden to the whims of the wind, for they rely not on the air to spread their spores, but on living couriers. These fungi are immensely varied in appearance, ranging from a relatively simple cap on top of a stipe as seen in Phallus rubicundus, to the delicate polygonal lattice of Colus pusillus. Then there's Acero rubra, the first fungus ever recorded in Australia, which appears for all the world to be something that would seem less out of place in a survey of the ocean's uncharted depths than a mulch bed in a public park just outside the city. But regardless of whether they look like sea anemones, or abandoned dog toys, or um, something else I can't quite think of, they share a common trait that anyone who gets close enough will very quickly discover. A foul odour, often reminiscent of rotting flesh. It is this stench that gives stinkhorns their common name and it is also instrumental in the dispersal of their spores. The source of the foul smell is a brownish slime called the gleba that coats certain portions of the fruiting body. Exactly which areas are covered by the slime varies depending on the species. The odour makes the gleba irresistible to flies and other insects, 
which are attracted in droves to the freshly emerged stinkhorns to feed on the slime. As they do so, they crawl all over the fruiting bodies, coating their feet in spores and thus becoming unwitting transportation vessels. For as the now spore-laden flies travel from place to place, they will deposit some of the stinkhorn spores wherever they land, and with a bit of luck, at least some of these spores will find themselves in a suitable habitat, and a new generation of stinkhorns will arise. Stinkhorns may have evolved to exploit the endeavours of insects, but there is another animal that has become something of an unintentional ally for these fungi, humans. As aforementioned, stinkhorns are prolific on wood chip mulch, wherein they perform the vital role of breaking down the dead plant matter and returning the nutrients contained to the soil. Wood chip mulch is, of course, very frequently used in parks and gardens, and as we transport it hither and thither across the country, we invariably take the resident fungi with it. We may very well be far more effective couriers for stinkhorns than the insects that they evolved to harness. These fungi are a sight best seen in the early morning, for with intricacy comes fragility, and their tenure above ground is fleeting. As the sun rises higher into the sky, these vibrant lattices, delicate veals, and I'm not describing that, will wither, and what was once a marvel of nature becomes little more than an amorphous mass slumped upon the earth from whence it arose. Stinkhorns are quick to garner anyone's attention, with their foul odours, bizarre forms, and vivid coloration. But some other fungi are perhaps even more difficult to overlook, not because they're smelly or brightly coloured, just really, really big. And as far as mushrooms go, this may very well be the biggest in the country, Phlebopus marginatus or at least that's what I think they are. With a cap that can be over half a metre wide, these fungi stand out garishly against almost any backdrop, their sheer size making them seem completely disproportionate with the features of the surrounding landscape. Unlike stinkhorns which feed on dead plant matter, Phlebopus form partnerships with living plants by integrating with their root systems an arrangement known as a mycorrhiza, the prefix myco referring to the fungus, and the suffix rhiza meaning root. Mycorrhizal associations are generally a mutualistic relationship between both parties involved. The plant supplies the fungus with organic molecules derived from photosynthesis, while the fungus augments the plant's access to soil-borne water and nutrients. Many plants noticeably benefit from such partnerships, and some are so dependent that they cannot survive in the absence of a fungal symbiont. Phlebopus marginatus belongs to an order of fungi called the Boletales, that most famously includes a somewhat informal group called the Bolets, which exhibit the quintessential mushroom shape, but on the underside of the cap possess pores instead of gills. Nevertheless, the pores serve the same function as gills, increasing the surface area and allowing more spores to be produced by any one mushroom. Bolets, at least from my experience, aren't exactly the most common sight in urban areas, which made these phlebopus all the more memorable to encounter. But if you venture even a little bit away from the hustle and bustle of the city, bolets reveal themselves to be quite abundant around Brisbane especially in the numerous bushland reserves scattered amongst the suburbs. Some of the most stunning are the members of the genus Boletellus, many of which have a remarkable shaggy texture that gives them an almost pineapple-like appearance. Perhaps the most common and familiar species in Australia is Boletellus emodensis, which is what I'd hazard a guess at assuming most if not all of the ones I've filmed are. Though there are a handful of similar species, like Boletellus deceptivus, that I can't definitively rule out. 
Like Phlebopus, these fungi are mycorrhizal, forming partnerships with living plants. Nearby are close relatives, also members of the Boletales, that don't look the part whatsoever. These Philoporus possess gills instead of pores, yet a more thorough examination of the fungus reveals that similarities with other bolets remain beneath the surface. Their spores are structurally alike to typical boletoid spores, and analysis of their genetics also supports a bolet affinity. Even more surprisingly, these Calistoma fuscum at Mount Nebo, growing together in a position that kinda makes me feel like I should censor the footage, are also bolet relatives, again belonging to the order Boletales. They have convergently evolved a similar method of spore dispersal to Earth stars, holding them inside a rounded sack with an opening at the apex, from which they are ejected when pressure is applied. And that brings us to the end of another showcase of marvellous, fascinating fungi. If the stinkhorns in particular were of interest to you, then feel free to check out this video that is all about them. And if you enjoy my content, then you are welcome to subscribe as well. Thank you all very much for watching. That is it from me, goodbye.